Welcome to today's online worship experience. I'm Pastor Anthony and I am very excited because today is Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. And we're so excited that you invited us in your space to worship together today. If you have your Bible, you can turn with me to the book of Romans chapter five, or you can go to your YouVersion Bible app, go to the menu, live events, type in North Park Church, and all of today's scriptures and notes are gonna be right there for you. As we dive into the message today, Resurrection Stories. Hey, I'm Will. I'm McGavick. And I'm Jeff. My name is Gary. I am Kimberly. This is Jeff and Terry. My name's Amy. My name is Travis, and this is my story. Going to church as a young young kid, uh, my parents always went to church, so I've, I've trusted in him even through times that I may not have um, been as close with him as I should be. Things are kind of hard when you're out on your own and you're rolling the dice and you're making uh, changes and decisions, but um, it's all about trust. So I actually grew up in church, raised Presbyterian, um, came up to Raleigh and started going to North Park. About the year 2015, my dad unfortunately passed away um, from cancer. And that was a very difficult time in my life. And I kind of strayed away from the church. Luckily, um, soon after I met my wife, Jenny, we started going to church together. We've had a sweet little baby girl, Ava. That is the greatest thing that I am thankful for that Jesus has done in my life. My journey started two years ago when the pandemic started. Didn't go to church a lot. Got divorced, I've been on my own. My kids are grown. My best friend said I needed to look at North Park. And it's, it's one of the best things I've ever done. I kind of just went through the motions for 50 plus years of my life. And now I find myself in this great church with great people, with great new friends, and with my life group, which has been an amazing experience. I've met some amazing people. I've learned some amazing things and I'm getting so much out of it. And I think there's so much more, you know, my heart is full and I think it will continue to stay that way. Jeff and I both grew up in church. When we were first dating and first married, our personal relationship with God was not a priority. However, when Elijah, our son was born, we wanted to commit to ourselves and to him, to raise him in a Christian home and to find a church family to help nurture his relationship with God. Next thing you know, we signed up for Mighty Might Football. From the beginning, Elijah was super excited about Coach Anthony. We showed up and Pastor Anthony introduced himself. As Pastor Anthony. As Pastor Anthony, it was the first time. But it clicked with us why we were so drawn to him, why he was such an amazing individual. And afterwards he said, do you guys go to church? Love for you to come some Sunday. Um, and the following Sunday, it was the like kids ministries um, Sunday. And so we pull up to church. And the Harlem Shuffle is on the stereo system pumping. <laughs> and I looked at McGavick and said, okay, here we go. We haven't looked back. <laughs> it's been one of the best experiences we've ever had. We knew immediately um, North Park was for us. It was an answer to prayer for me, and it showed me and reminded me that God is always pursuing us. God is always providing the plan, providing the path if you trust Him. I've been blessed time after time in ways that I didn't anticipate, in moments when I thought things were too difficult, or I couldn't do them, or I was facing burnout or anxiety or whatever we want to call it. He answered every single time in, in ways that I didn't expect, or uh, were completely just a work of Him. The most incredible thing I, I think I see is that he's fulfilling dreams that I don't even know, that I didn't, didn't even conceptualize, and I'm just so thankful for, for his goodness in, in all that I do. We were very fortunate growing up that we had parents who introduced us to uh, the Lord at a very young age, but like most people, we wandered away. But what we discovered when we ran into some rough patches in our marriage, we didn't know where to turn. And so we just then started remembering what our parents had taught us. And what we saw him do in our lives was totally revamp our marriage to the point where we can honestly say right now that every day is better than the day before. Things may not get smooth for us right away, 
but we know that he will take care of us, that he will see us through, and that his plan and purpose for us is way better than we could ever imagine. And I found that some of the most painful times in my life have been some of the most powerful times that Jesus has moved in my life. And that I know he's there, especially in our marriage, getting us through some very turbulent times. He's just as close as his name and he's there and he gives us hope and he gave me hope. And I just praise him and thank him for it every day. During the pandemic, it was a time that I felt defeated. I felt uh, confused about my purpose. I was insecure about myself and my relationship with God. Um, I knew God and I knew who he had been in my life already and who he was going to be right now. However, I still felt a void in my life that my family or my friends could not feel. I felt like I was at the end of my rope and I did not want him to ask me to do anything more than what I was already doing. But at that moment, I was just so weak and stripped of my confidence. I questioned God and I was asking him, what had I done to be going through what I was going through. God taught me the true meaning of forgiveness during that time, which allowed me not to only forgive the people who had hurt me, but also to reflect on who I was and what I might have done to prevent me from fulfilling his purpose in my life. But most importantly, I found the joy and the peace that so many search for, but are unable to find. I thank God for choosing me for loving me and taking me back every time I lost my way. Kiss my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down and drove steps to the entrance sealed by heavy stone.
as an alcoholic, I intentionally lived my life in a way that I chose to not believe in God. If there was a God, then I knew I would have to pay for the decisions and the actions that I made. And as I continued to live my life that way, um, depression and anxiety and the guilt and the shame of life continued to grow. And eventually, getting sober, I spent several months with no real firm direction. I had established a relationship with God and an understanding that I had fought for so long, um, but it wasn't until I reached a point in sobriety that the suicidal thoughts and the depression and the anxiety grew so bad that I knew I needed to take that next step. Um, and that next step led me to North Park, and my life has forever changed since then. I grew up in a Christian home. My parents instilled great morals and Christianity into to myself and my brother. And I always believed in God and went to church on Sundays, you know, Wednesday nights, the whole thing. But um, through college and after college, I got heavily involved in alcohol. Alcoholism really had grips on me and on my life. And it took me down hard and it took me down fast. Any relationship that I had with God God was put way on the back burner. I didn't think that I was worthy of God's love anymore. I thought that why would God, you know, save me from this? I wasn't worthy in my eyes. Upon getting sober through a program of recovery several years ago, I found my relationship with God again. Well, I will say that I found my relationship with God in the first place because I don't think I really ever had a relationship with God until I got sober. Really started coming to church and started coming to North Park, connecting with other people around me, being in a life group and, and my relationships just started to blossom. And I think that that is huge in my relationship with God. Although I always believed in God, I just never had that relationship with Him. So now that, you know, I am I'm sober and have been for several years now, I have a great relationship with God that's ever changing, that's ever growing. You know, I feel like every year my relationship with God changes and grows. Uh, and just becomes something greater. That's because of my church and my family, not because of anything that I do personally, but because of God and His His great love. So yeah, that's um, that's my story, and I'm so grateful for this opportunity to to share it with you guys. I love stories. I'm a storyteller. I am a part of a family where everybody loves to tell stories. And the bigger the story, the better. If the Braswells are going to do anything, they're going to tell and retell the same story over and over and over again. And it's just going to keep getting bigger. The reason I like stories is because there is power in a story when it's something that you have experienced. And one of the greatest ways for us to walk this faith out with Jesus is to share our stories about what God has done in us. Today is really all about resurrection stories. And churches all over the world, pastors will stand up and they'll share what resurrection means to them. Today is a great day to do that. But I wanna take a little different perspective by asking some different questions. What does the resurrection mean to you. What is your resurrection story? Think about all of the different perspectives and stories from people that were present at the actual crucifixion. Can you imagine hearing their stories? What would Pilate say about the resurrection? What would the soldiers who crucified Jesus say about the resurrection? What would Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary Magdalene, Peter, John, Thomas, the followers of Jesus that he appeared to on the road to Emmaus. What would those people have to say about the resurrection? I think the common theme would be this. The resurrection of Jesus changes everything. So my question to you is, what is your resurrection story? What does the resurrection mean to you? In light of what Jesus has done for you, the fact that he gave his life, that he died on a cross for you, and three days later rose from the dead, what does that mean for you? How does that change your perspective or change the way that you live your life? Because I'm convinced that the resurrection of Jesus literally changes everything. 
And Romans chapter 8, verse 11 is one of my favorite verses of Scripture about the resurrection of Jesus. It says this, The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, He will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. As I think about how the resurrection changes my life, I love that verse of Scripture. Because I get to see that Jesus died on the cross for me. He rose from the dead for me. And now because of the Holy Spirit, the gift that he's given to us as followers of Jesus, we have the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. And that same spirit that brought Jesus from the dead now resides on the inside of us. And we have this power at work that gives us the strength to love, to serve, to help, to share, to speak life into people around us and even walk through some of the most difficult moments of our life because of what Jesus has done for us, because of the hope that we find in the resurrection story. It changes everything for us, the resurrection. It is absolutely without a doubt a game changer. Now I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm gonna give you a little a little insight into who I am as a person, and this may shock you, but I'm gonna make this confession right here with our online audience today, and here it goes. I'm a dude who actually likes Hallmark movies. I know, it's surprising, but I do. And the reason that I like Hallmark movies is because most movies, there's a formula, right? They gradually build tension to a climax and then they resolve that crisis. And it's a formula that never really fails to satisfy an audience. But here's the great thing that Hallmark movies do that I love. They resolve that tension very quickly. I don't like that kind of tension. I, I remember going to see Dear Evan Hansen, this uh, really great um, Broadway production that creates this tension and then it just leaves it there and leaves it there and leaves it there. I thought I was going to die. Like I just needed to get out of that environment because I don't like tension. And so I love the fact that Hallmark just like resolves tension very, very, very quickly. If you know me as a person, I just want to be okay and I want everybody else around me to be okay. I want the situation to just be okay. What I'm saying is we all want relief. We want relief from the tension that exists in our life. But the problem is tension is often very necessary because without tension, we can actually get stuck into certain places in our life. But once the tension is created, the only way to relieve that tension is to move forward. It becomes necessary to move forward. And let's be honest, so many of us have tension in many different areas of our lives. Maybe your marriage feels very unresolved. There's tension and you just want to like move your relationship forward to get past that tension so that you can experience this peace in your home that you desire. Maybe there's tension in other relationships and it's just killing you. Maybe you're in a tight financial position and you're living with that tension. Maybe you feel like something's about to happen in your career and in your job, but right now there's a lot of tension and you know you just can't go on like this. You want the tension to be relieved. You want the crisis moment, the climax moment to just be resolved. Maybe there's some unresolved issues in other areas of your life and you just want relief. Now, you know how that tension feels in these areas of your life. Now think about what the followers of Jesus must have felt for those long three days between Jesus' death and his resurrection. I mean, he was supposed to be the person that would change everything for them. And it's almost like all of their hopes, their expectations and dreams died on that cross with Jesus. And so here are these disciples who were following him and they'd given all of this to follow Jesus. Now his body's laid in a tomb. And for three days, that tension is just there. The grief, the sorrow. And I'm sure like you in your situations and me in my situations, we just want the tension to go away. And then on the third day, everything changed for them. Here's the big idea for today. The resurrection brings relief. The resurrection provides relief from that tension in their life and in yours. 
Think about the tension that you need God to resolve in your life. That same resurrection power in your life can bring that relief to those tensions that you experience in any area of your life. The resurrection of Jesus, it is without a doubt, the game changer for you too. Now let's look at Romans chapter five and we're gonna look through a few, few verses of scripture today. Here's the first verse. It says, therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Christ Jesus, our Lord has done for us. Think about that phrase, peace with God. Because of the resurrection, we have peace with God. There is more relief in those three words, peace with God, than any other words than I can imagine. I need that peace with God. You need that peace with God. But peace doesn't just refer to this inner tranquility, although that's part of the peace that we feel. But peace refers to the fact that we are no longer subject to judgment because of our sin because of what Jesus has done on his cross, his life, his death, and his resurrection. When Jesus died on the cross for your sins, he paid the ultimate price so you didn't have to, so you could experience peace. All you need to do is put your faith and trust in him and invite him to be the Lord of your life. Now, trust is a very peculiar resource. It's the one thing that's built when we use it rather than being depleted. The more that you exercise trust in your life, it doesn't deplete the trust. Instead, the trust begins to be multiplied. The more that you trust him, the more you begin to trust him. Look at verse two. Because of your faith, Christ has brought us into this place. I love this word picture of undeserved privilege where we now stand. We didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. We didn't fight for it. This is what Jesus has done for us. And we, here it is, confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing in his glory. The resurrection gives us confidence and the resurrection gives us joy. And now we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing in God's glory. I don't know about you, but I believe what our world needs is more joy. We need confidence. And joy is not just this natural response to life. I can't look at you and say, be more joyful. I can't look at you and say, have more joy. The joy of the Lord is a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. It's a fruit of the Spirit of God. That is a result of being in His presence. It's not a natural emotion. It's not tied to circumstance like happiness or sadness. Something happens, you feel sad. Something happens, you feel happy. But the reality is you can be sad and walk through difficult moments of your life and still have joy because it is not a natural response to life. It is a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And because of the resurrection, because of the gift of the Holy Spirit, you can have confidence and you can have joy. The resurrection allows us those things. And I don't know about you, but there is this word that in my mind is tethered to the resurrection. And that is the word hope, hope. And I know sometimes when we use the word hope, we use it, I don't know, incorrectly, it diminishes the value of this word hope because it's almost like this idea of wishful thinking. I hope NC State has a good football team this year. Maybe wishful thinking. I hope all of my laundry is going to be washed, dried, and folded when I get home. Wishful thinking, right? I hope I win the lottery. I didn't buy a ticket, but I hope I win it, right? It's this idea of wishful thinking. But the word used by the Apostle Paul is a noun meaning this, an assured expectation. When I think about the future that I have in Jesus, it is, it is not wishful thinking. My relationship with him, my hope to spend eternity rejoicing around the throne of God, that is not wishful thinking. It is an assured expectation. It's what I get to experience as a result of putting my faith and trust in him. I have confidence. I am joyful. I have hope because of the sacrifice of Jesus, the life, the death, and his resurrection. The resurrection changes everything. 
And then Paul tells us that we don't have to wait until that day that he returns to rejoice. But right here on this earth, even in the toughest moments of our lives, we can rejoice. Look at verse three. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials for we know that they help us develop endurance and endurance develops strength of character and character strengthens our hope, our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment for we know how dearly God loves us. And because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. Now we get that part because so many of you are walking through some difficult moments of your life. You're walking through problems and you're walking through trials. You get that part. Failing health, job loss, grief, divorce, persecution, the list goes on and on. Alexander Hamilton said, it is the maxim of my life to enjoy the present good with the highest levels of relish and to soften this present evil by a hope of future good. What's he saying? We can walk through some difficult moments because we have hope of something very different. The tension is softened by our hope. And here's the best part, the same Holy Spirit that brought Jesus from the grave gives us the ability to rejoice under pressure and endure the most difficult moments of our life. And when we look back at these moments, and that's all life is, right? Life is a collection of these moments. And when we look back at these moments, even the difficult ones can be beautiful opportunities for growth. I want you to lean into this one statement because I think it's powerful. And here it is. Nothing in your life is wasted. You can be certain that God is up to something good, even in the crisis that you may be in right now in this moment. I came across this beautiful quote from Bob Goff, and this is what it says. Even with all of the pain in your life, there is hope. Evil always looks like it's going to win right until it doesn't. I'm so grateful that death did not have the final word when it comes to Jesus because the resurrection changed everything. And I want you to know that grief doesn't have the final word. Your loss and pain doesn't have the final word. Your fired is not the final word. I don't love you anymore, not the final word. You can have a confident hope. Evil always looks like it's going to win right up until it doesn't. The final word is what Jesus has spoken over your life. And he wants this incredible relationship with you. He wants you to embrace him, his life, his death, and his resurrection. And when you do, it changes everything. I want to pray for you today, but I want you to be reminded of this one thought. Jesus did not wait for you to get it all together and figure it out. He decided to step in and rescue you right where you are. Listen to Romans 5, 6 through 8. It says, while we were utterly helpless... Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who's especially good. But here's a great verse. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die while we were yet still sinners. I want to pray for you that right where you are, you don't have to get it together. You don't have to figure it out. But I want you to recognize that Jesus stepped in to bring you out. Jesus, I thank you so much for those who are watching today. I thank you that you meet us wherever we are. Lord, I thank you that you're meeting us today in a corporate gathering where we worship you with our church family. Lord, I thank you that you meet those right where they are when they're riding down the road or they're sitting with their family in their home or they're on a treadmill, wherever they are experiencing your word today. God, I pray you would meet them right where they are. And Lord, I pray that you would give them this joy and this confident hope, God, that you would give them this unbelievable experience, this relationship with you, that all is required is their faith and trust. Lord, that they would just open their heart, that they would confess with their mouth and believe in their heart. Lord, that you would just meet them right where they are. They don't have to figure it out or get it all together. All they have to do is trust you. 
And I pray that as they open their hearts that you would be so real to them. God, that you would wrap your arms around them and through the power of the Holy Spirit, minister to them right where they are today. God, remind them of how deep and wide your love really is. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray, amen. As always, thanks so much for joining us today. It means the world to us that you spent some time with us on Easter Sunday. We love to get to know you. One way that we can do that is you go over to NorthParkRDU.com and click that digital connect card. That's a great connecting point so that we get to know more about you and you can get to know more about us. We can put some great information in your hands that you can get plugged into North Park Church, but also some incredible resources to help you on this journey as you grow in this relationship with Jesus. One of the ways that you can do that is by joining one of our life groups. We have a group of people that would love to come alongside of you to help you in this journey, but also to give you an opportunity to speak life into someone else. We believe that life change happens in the context of meaningful relationships. So for more information about life groups, just head over to northparkrdu.com and we'd love to get you plugged in today. We can't wait to see you in person very soon. Join us next Sunday and please know that you are loved and we're cheering you on.